My grandpa used to work as a stevedore over in Savannah, and he'd tell us all kinds of stories from his time on the job. Like one time, they got a whole shipment of bananas from the Philippines or somewhere, and back in those days they'd transport the bananas still attached to the big old branches that they grew on. They'd pop the crate and then carefully pull the bananas out wearing real thick pairs of gloves, and they wore those gloves because of the tarantulas. The tarantulas didn't eat the bananas, but other smaller creepy crawlies would, making the banana branches a prime feeding ground for them. Most of the time, the workers over on the other side of the ocean would do their best to get all the bugs off their produce, but every so often, a tarantula would tuck itself away among the bunches after getting its fill of bugs, and then survive the entire transit process from whatever tropical islands that they were from to the ports of the United States. My grandpa said that one time he was working with this guy popping crates of bananas when the guy started to get a little too comfortable. He starts getting slow, talking when he should have been working, and then the next thing, grandpa's turning around to see this guy's arm deep in a crate, but looking back at grandpa trying to talk to him and paying no mind to what he was doing. Grandpa said that the second he turned around, he saw this huge, hairy spider just slowly wandering up the guy's arm, biggest thing he'd ever seen during all those years on the job. The guy couldn't feel it because of the big, thick, elbow-length glove that they used to wear to prevent spider bites and whatnot. Grandpa freezes, scared out of his wits, and then just points at the thing crawling up the guy's arm. Only then does the guy actually pay attention to what he's doing, but by then, it was too late. He sees the spider, then lets out this almighty yelp of terror, but this only succeeds in freaking the spider out too. I'm guessing the thing just kind of reacted on instinct and moved to neutralize the threat, so to speak. And still, instead of just jumping off his arm or something, the tarantula runs up the guy's sleeve and then makes this crazy leap right at the guy's face. Grandpa said that the guy's second scream, the one he did when the tarantula hit his face, was just about the loudest and most terrifying noise he'd ever heard. It was like, like a death scream or something. Like the kind of sound a person can only make when they're in fear for their lives. Grandpa said that he did the first thing that came to mind, which was grab something to try and whack the spider off the guy's face. He grabbed a broom, and then turned to run back over to his co-worker, but saw that he'd already batted the spider off of him and was running for the door of the warehouse. They get outside, slam the door behind them, and Grandpa's checking if the guy is okay when he sees these two big puncture marks on the guy's lower cheek from where the spider had bit him. Again, Grandpa is dumbstruck with fright and all he can do is quietly point towards where this guy's been bit. I think maybe he just didn't know that he had been bitten, maybe from the adrenaline or what have you, but a moment later, the guy puts a hand to his face and realizes that he's been bitten and then promptly passes out. Grandpa thought that the guy was dead. He thought the spider's venom had gone straight to the guy's brain and killed him dead in an instant. But then, the same deadly spider is now loose in one of the warehouses, so Grandpa goes running off to warn everyone that his co-worker was dead and that there would be more deaths if they didn't get the hell out of the area. He starts screaming at everyone to run for their lives because some deadly spider just jumped out of a crate and killed the guy he was working with. And this causes a full-blown panic on the docks, with half the guys running to save their skins and the other half organizing impromptu hunting parties so they could track the spider down and kill it. In truth, the guy who had been bitten wasn't dead at all, he just passed out, like I said. But then the area around the bite got so swollen and red so fast that even though the guy woke up and started wandering around, confused, it didn't really do much to calm the situation down. The reality was that, even though the bites from the spider were very nasty, they weren't even close to deadly. But since this was like the late 50s or something, there was no Discovery Channel back then, and folks just kind of assumed that every tropical tarantula had a bite that could kill a man stone dead in mere minutes. You had all these stevedores running around with just about any kind of weapon they could get their hands on until finally one of the bosses got wind of what was going on. He shut the place down for the night, called in animal control, and they sent a guy over to find and trap the spider before they took it over to some museum or something for identification. 
The guy who got bit spent the night in the hospital and then was back at work just a few days later. We always enjoyed hearing that story, but the thing is, that wasn't even the scariest or craziest story my grandpa had from his time as a stevedore. He'd always break the spider story out for the younger crowd at family gatherings, and after miming all the spider stuff with his fingers of one hand, he'd almost always have all the little girls running off in disgust while all the little boys sat around him, completely enraptured by the tale of an encounter with a great hairy monster. But then, after they'd all gone to bed or their parents had taken them home, he'd break out the wilder stories for the adults. Most of these consisted of things like fellas sneaking their girlfriends onto the job with them, then getting caught catching seven minutes in heaven together in a back office or shipping container, or the time they stole a whole crate of scotch because they realized that there was a mistake on one of the shipping manifests. The right call would have been to simply correct the manifest, but nope, almost $5,000 worth of luxury scotch went poof and disappeared, and everyone had a very Merry Christmas that year. But then on one occasion, he told us a straight-up horror story. Back during his first year of being a stevedore, my grandpa worked with this guy called Crazy Al. Al was a war veteran, as in he was in the army during World War II. The guys on the docks knew that he served in the Pacific Islands, and they knew that he'd seen some pretty messed up stuff too, but that was it. No one ever asked Crazy Al about the stuff that he'd seen or where he'd fought because no one wanted to upset him, and no one wanted to upset him because, like I said, he's Crazy Al. My grandpa said everyone felt for the guy, but that he wasn't particularly popular neither, on account of him being almost impossible to work with. Crazy Al couldn't be around loud noises, and woe betide anyone who accidentally startled him, so instead of working the warehouses and whatnot like the rest of the workers, grandpa said Crazy Al was kept in the equipment room, where folks went to get tools, slings, safety gear, and things of that nature. He just didn't walk in, either. You knocked really softly on the door till Al came to ask you what you wanted, and that way, he was kept at a safe distance from everyone else. Anyway, one day, the docks get this big old cargo ship coming in, only right away, they can tell something is different about it, because some of the containers had different kinds of letters on them. It turns out, the ship had come all the way from South Korea, and since the country was rebuilding from the war at that time, I figured this was one of the first Korean ships to dock in America for quite a while. So the ship docks, and these two Korean officers walk down the gangplank to greet the foreman in perfect English. They exchange a few words, discuss the unloading of their ship, then off they went back to their quarters while the stevedores got to work. Some time later, Crazy Al comes out of the equipment shed for some reason. Someone later said that they saw him walk out, and when he saw the ship floating in the dock, he just stopped and stared at it, like he was hypnotized or something. According to my grandpa, this person mentioned Crazy Al's episode to one of his co-workers, but since Al had more than earned his nickname by that point, it was kind of like, what else is new? And so the last people saw of Al... He was marching across the dock with a crowbar in hand, heading straight for the gangplank of the Korean ship. Then the next thing, everyone on the dock started to hear screaming coming from it. And there are screams and shouts all in Korean and from the sounds of things, it was like they were having some kind of fight up there. And the next thing, gunshots. And so everyone scatters and the cops get called. Everyone's still sort of hiding out, keeping an eye on the ship when the cops show up and run aboard with their guns drawn. And there, they find Crazy Al, shot to death with a crowbar in his hand. Then in the vicinity were two dead Koreans, beat to death by Al, and about half a dozen wounded Korean soldiers, one of which had shot Crazy Al dead with a gun that they kept on board for emergencies. For years... Everyone kind of figured that Al had mistaken the Koreans for Japanese, which is obviously one of the two countries we were at war with while Al was serving as a soldier. But the truth is much more disturbing. You see, as it turned out, Al had been a prisoner in a Japanese POW camp, a particularly brutal one too. He'd seen his fellow soldiers tortured, 
executed and slowly worked to death over the course of two to three years. He learned to hate the camp's guards, but not all of them were Japanese. Part of Japan's conquest of Asia included the Korean Peninsula, and they gave a lot of Koreans a chance to prove their loyalty to their new masters by serving as guards in their prisoner of war camps. Then, to prove just how fanatically loyal they really were, they treated American POWs way, way crueler than the Japanese did as a way of winning over their new masters. And Crazy Al probably had his very own Korean camp guard, and I'm not saying it could possibly excuse what he did to those poor sailors, but it certainly explains why he turned so murderous just at the sight of them. The thing is, folks just carried on thinking Al was crazy. Couldn't tell the difference between Korean and Japanese, they'd say. Stupid old crazy Al, crazier than a poop house rat. But then, it seems to me and my grandpa that Al wasn't all that crazy after all. Sure, he was disturbed, but there's a chilling kind of clarity to him choosing to take vengeance like that. The way my grandpa tells it, he was just quiet. He didn't run across the docks, screaming and cursing, waving his crowbar around. He just walked, all cool and calm to try and commit a massacre without saying a word. And that little detail never fails to creep me out. My name's Ali. I'm 23 and I'm from East Lothian here in Scotland. I've been a fan of the channel for a while now, so I know this probably doesn't qualify as your typical scary story, but it's something that's been bothering me for a long time, and if it scares me, then I'm pretty sure it'll scare your viewers too. Three and a half years ago, a lad that I went to school with murdered his grandparents. It happened on Boxing Day of 2021, and it was all over the news the next morning that this lovely old couple had been found stabbed to death in their own home. Police said that they'd arrested the person that had done it, but for the first few days, they didn't release any details on who they were. Then, once they were sure that they were going to charge the person with murder, the police announced who it was, their own grandson. As you can probably imagine, everyone was absolutely gobsmacked when they found out, but what we wanted to know was why. Why kill your own grandparents in such a horrible way on the day after Christmas, too? We had to wait ages for the hearing and all, but there were loads of rumors flying around about why he'd killed them. I think most people thought that it was like a mental illness thing. So, when the hearing kicked off and the lad's lawyers told the court that he heard voices telling him to kill his nan and granddad, there was this collective thing of, told you so. I understand why people would choose to believe that too, I mean, why else would someone kill two people that love and care for them? This lad was living with them at the time and they were looking after him too, properly, and they weren't abusive or anything, so he had to be mental to do something so horrible, right? But no one knew him thought that though, at least no one I knew anyway, because in actual fact, the guy had always been like that. At school, everyone called him James, or Jay for short, and even back then he was a proper weirdo. And I don't mean a little bit of a weirdo, like lovably weird. I mean he was a complete arsehole. He was a bit of a goth, loved his rock music, obsessed over horror films, but none of the other goths in our school would hang around with him because he was a total dick. I'm sure the school had a name for whatever condition he had, antisocial behavior disorder or something, but to us, he was just an arsehole. Some of my mates grew up with dyslexia, autism, ADHD, you name it, but they were sound guys, that lovable kind of weird, whereas Jay was just an arrogant prick with a bad case of main character syndrome. The last I heard of Jay, he changed his name from James to Vincent, and people wondered why for a bit until someone worked out that it was because he was obsessed with some vampire film that had a character with that name. And that was Jay in a nutshell, really. He thought he was better than he really was when, really, he was just a sad act. We thought that's all he was, too. A total dickhead, but a fairly harmless one. 
and then he went and murdered his own bloody grandparents and proved us all wrong. I actually did start to believe that Jay had gone just mental because we started hearing all this stuff about how he was hearing voices and that he didn't really remember killing his nana and granddad and just sort of came to after it happened. You see, he actually handed himself into the police after he'd done it, went right down to the police station and told them everything. So to me, it sort of did seem like he'd had a mad psychotic episode then felt terrible afterwards. But then we all heard something about how the thing that caused Jay to snap was an argument over a Christmas hamper. Someone had sent Jay's grandparents a load of wine and cheese or whatever, or maybe a few of those miniature whiskey samplers. Either way, there was alcohol involved and Jay decided that he wanted it all for himself. He very selfishly F's off to his bedroom with the booze and then up the stairs comes granddad to tell him to give it back. An argument ensued, nasty words were exchanged, but then Jay's solution was to grab a kitchen knife and stab both of his grandparents so deep that there were knife marks on their bones. Jay's lawyers obviously managed to weave in the whole story about him being a schizophrenic and I read that some doctor agreed that he wasn't fit to stand trial. He never went to prison, He's in some mental institution now, but I think that's exactly what he wanted. I don't give a monkey's toss what some doctor has to say about it, because anyone who knew him knows that Jay has always been like that. If he didn't get his way, he threw a fit, which is basically why he had no friends in school. I also think Jay's behavioral problems are why he ended up living with his grandparents in the first place. He turned 18, his parents told him to get his act together or get out of their house, and the grandparents stepped in to take care of him. All that considered, I think it makes what he did to them extra terrible. They gave him a chance and he returned the favor by stabbing them both to death on freaking Boxing Day of all days. I don't think he's sorry either. I mean, I think he regrets killing them because he has to face the consequences of his actions, but that's all he's sorry for. First thing he did after killing his grandparents was to think, how can I spin this to make me look as good as possible, which was exactly the same kind of thing he did in school. Not long ago, me and a few pals went to a local boozer for a few pints on Boxing Day and I ended up bumping into one of the goths that I used to hang around with in school. We swapped a wee bit of small talk at first, you know the sort of how you been, what you been up to, but then after we gotten a few drinks in us, the subject of Weirdo J came up and he ended up telling me what happened to make his little friend group exclude him, and by the time he'd finished, I was practically picking my jaw up off the floor. They'd been hanging around with Jay just after school kicked out, walking through the school car park to where the bus stop for school pickups used to be. He said Jay picked up a rock, then just hurled it through the car window of a teacher he'd clashed with that day. They were all like, what the bloody hell do you think you're doing, you rage? And then everyone legs it, but then the next day, they all get dragged up to the head teacher's office where there's a police officer waiting for them. The whole thing had been partially caught on camera, so the teachers knew roughly who it was. They just needed to figure out exactly who did it and why. The goth lads, once they were told it had been caught on camera, owned up to the fact that they'd been there when the window was smashed, but they also told the truth when they said that it was Jay's fault and that he'd done it out of the blue. One second, they're just walking along having a bit of crack, and the next, Jay's lashing a stone through the car's window. All four goth lads said the same thing, but then when it came time to question Jay about it, he gave an excuse that sounds frighteningly familiar. He told the head, and the bobby who was with him, that it was the four goth lads that had bullied him into doing it. According to Jay, the lads that he was with had threatened him with a good old-fashioned kicking if he didn't smash the window, so to save himself a hiding, he did as they told him. And that was Jay all over. Nothing was ever his fault, there was always someone else to blame. Every situation he entered himself into was unfair and folks conspired against him no matter where he went or what he did. But then, I'm sure you're asking by now, why didn't Jay get expelled for smashing a teacher's car window? Well, word was that he put on such a good show that the teachers didn't know who to believe. So rather than go ahead and press charges against him or exclude him from school, Jay ended up with a week's suspension 
and then he was allowed to come back. But then the other goth lads got the same punishment too. He obviously stopped hanging around with those goth boys, but it wasn't because they were bullying him. It was because he couldn't manipulate and control them. To me, I see exact parallels between what happened with that car window and what happened with his grandparents. He learned from a very early age that it's possible to manipulate the system, even though you've done something wrong. The lad that I bumped into at the pub said that, after the whole window smashing incident, Jay had personally told him that he was untouchable. He used that exact word too, untouchable. They never hung around with him again after that, having secured the title of the most arrogant prick they'd ever had the displeasure of coming across. But Jay didn't just stay some arrogant gobshite. He got worse and worse, until in the end, when he learned that he couldn't manipulate his grandparents anymore. He just killed them. If he'd just gone to prison for 30, 40 years, it wouldn't bother me so much and I 100% wouldn't be writing this. But an absolute psychopath of the cringiest order has managed to game the system and basically get away with murder. Instead of living the rest of his life in a vulnerable prisoner's unit, because blokes are rightfully kicking the crap out of him for killing two lovely old deers who wanted nothing more than to look after their wayward grandson, Jay is living out the rest of his life in relative comfort, having completely cheated the system and won. And that scares me more than any ghost story ever could. My grandpa had one hell of a war. He turned 18 in December of 43, got drafted almost right away, then landed in France sometime in the fall of 44. His outfit was some kind of supply company that operated to the rear of the front line, so he didn't see much actual fighting. All he did was load trucks, drive someplace, and then unload them. Then just a few months later, the leader of Deutschland, as you know him, blew his brains out. The war was over, but my grandpa's service was not, and instead of heading home like a lot of the battle-hardened infantry units, Grandpa stayed in Germany and continued to load trucks. Then one day, some high-ranking officer showed up at my grandpa's unit and starts asking where he is. My grandpa's name was Murphy, he's Irish, but only on my great-grandpa's side. His mother had been a German immigrant and had spoken a heck of a lot of the old language around him when he was a kid. So much so that despite not being able to speak German, he could sure as heck understand it. There was such a demand for translators at the time that army intelligence was searching up anyone of even the slightest German heritage in hopes that they'd be able to help translate documents or interpret conversations. But then, in the case of my grandpa, he was given a very different kind of task. When he'd confirmed that my grandpa could understand enough German to be of use to him, the officer told him to get into his jeep then off they drove to some intelligence unit where my grandpa and a bunch of other soldiers could get a short briefing. Long story short, they were to pose as guards in various prisoner of war camps, but their real job was to just listen. Anyone higher than a private first class was to receive a very temporary demotion, and each of them was to master the art of looking very bored and very dumb. My grandpa said the first part was easy, because for the most part, German POWs talked about the same crap American soldiers did. They complained about the latrines, about the food, and about each other, all very inoffensive stuff. Then one by one, depending on the kind of stuff that they'd been up to during the war, they were either hanged, forced into labor battalions, or given their freedom. My grandpa said that over the months that followed, his camp's population kept shrinking and shrinking until there were rumors that they were going to close the place down altogether. Then one day, hundreds of these SS guerrillas marched right up to the camp's gates, flying this big old white flag and asked to surrender. Turns out this rogue unit of Germany's most loyal bodyguards had been hiding out in the woods for months, and when they weren't taking pot shots at Americans, they were terrorizing the local Germans for collaborating with the U.S. Friendly forces had been trying to starve the rogue unit out for a while, so they figured their surrender was simply a natural result of their efforts. There was just one problem. 
The camp's guard contingency had been scaled down as the number of prisoners began to dwindle, meaning that by the time these SS guys showed up, there were eight prisoners for every one American camp guard. At first, the camp's commander was somehow completely fine with this and saw it was an opportunity to prove how just a handful of American boys could keep a lid on hundreds of rabid SS. But he was wrong, and if it hadn't been for my grandpa, a lot of people would have paid with their lives. Grandpa said that one day he was on guard duty when, for the first time during his whole stay at the POW camp, he heard something that sounded vaguely suspicious. All these hardened SS prisoners had been on their best behavior. Not a single one had stepped out of line. But then after my grandpa overhears one say to another, how much longer will we have to wait? Which was a fairly common question among the prisoners. The other replied, Vartanov the signal. Which means, we wait for the signal. Now obviously, my grandpa is thinking, what signal? But he had also been explicitly ordered to report anything like that to his superiors. Words like plan, plot, or code. These were all things that were of great interest because the main goal by that point was to prevent war criminals from escaping or destroying evidence of their crimes. But signal, that was something else entirely. The second his superiors heard about someone throwing the word signal around, they flooded the camp with extra guards, then got my grandpa to point out the soldiers that he'd heard use it. Sometime later, I imagine after an extensive period of interrogation, one of the SS guys finally talks and gives up their whole crazy plan. You see, all these SS fanatics might have showed up flying a white flag, but they hadn't really surrendered. Like I mentioned, they'd been hiding out in the area for months, following out Germany's final order to fight to the bitter end, but they never hit the POW camp on account of it being full of Germans. They also never opted to mount any kind of prison break, but by that time, that was neither here nor there, I guess. And so one day, a few SS scouts snuck up to the camp and happened to notice that there was only a handful of prisoners, but more importantly, only about two dozen camp staff and guards. They reported this back to their commander who came up with an extremely fiendish plan. Fake a surrender, overwhelm the camp guards, then loot weapons and ammo to continue their partisan struggle against the Americans. But the SS didn't just want weapons and ammo. Oh no, they had a much bigger prize in mind, and that prize was American uniforms. If they could disguise themselves as Americans in unblemished uniforms, the SS could amount devastating attacks on our boys, especially if you had an SS soldier disguised as, say, an American officer, of which there were plenty of the camp staff. By overhearing that word signal and bringing it to the attention of the superiors, my grandpa saved countless lives. So many, in fact, that his superiors sought to award him a bronze star. I thought they only gave those things out for combat-related heroism. Turns out they award them for other things, too. They just gotta be real significant kinds of things to be worth considering. The whole thing made him a minor celebrity among the boys he served with, and around six months later... He was discharged and sent home. My grandpa never considered himself a hero. He always said that he was simply doing his job. But I got the medal and the citation that proves that he saved, and I quote, scores, if not hundreds of lives. And to me, that's just about plain a definition of a hero as it's possible to get. One particular story my granddad told me last year really stuck with me. When he lived in Britain during World War II, as the London Blitz happened, and he remembered seeing a German aircraft dropping a bomb on High Street in Lewisham when he was working there as a cinema projectionist. And since the street was so wide, the German plane was able to descend in between the buildings themselves. All the staff at the cinema he worked at used to be air raid watchers, so when they were sending over the flying bombs like that, he and his friends had to go up on the roof and spot them. One instance was where there was a buzz bomb coming straight at him, and he pressed the button for the alarm to alert the bystanders below. 
Luckily, the engines were designed to cut out, so it nosedived down and struck Lewisham Market about another 200 meters up the road. So he and a couple of his friends went to try and help with the casualties. There were about 52 killed, several hundred wounded, and he helped to try and get stretchers there. And he said that there were people with no arms, no legs, and no heads. One other time he said that he saw people trapped in a building on fire after a bombing, but there was nothing he could do to help them. After that, he never, ever boiled water in those old-style kettles that whistle. He always filled a pot and boiled it like he was making soup or something. My grandma learned the hard way when she used a hissing kettle and then walked into the living room to see my granddad curled up in a ball on the floor with his hands over his ears. He said the whistles reminded him of all the people screaming inside the burning building. My pop-pop is a real straight-laced conservative kind of guy, just about the last guy you'd expect to have been a major hippie back during his youth. He used to be a beatnik, as they called him back then, but after falling out of love with berets and snappy poetry, he grew out his hair and beard, got himself a motorcycle, and then rode off into the sunset. And he went everywhere, too, all over Canada and the United States and down through Central and South America, all while lovingly maintaining this old BSA. He's got some crazy stories from those years, but none so creepy as this one. And so, like I said, Pop Pop drove down through Mexico, financed by all the money he'd earned while up in Canada, working as a motorcycle taxi in remote areas during the fall. He has a ton of wild stories from his time in the Great White North, but for now I'll just stick to this one. Pop Pop would drive from place to place, sometimes staying in some pretty nice places too. But the further out into the sticks you got, the more you had to rely on what the Mexicans call posadas. Posadas are basically like inns or taverns, but on a much smaller scale than you might be imagining. Sometimes they're just a spare room in someone's house, and for a small fee, the owners will feed you a little breakfast too. Pop Pop stayed in a lot of these posadas while he was driving through Mexico, and he even made a second trip to some of them during the returning leg of his journey. But there was one posada that he vowed never to go back to as long as he lived. He said that one posada had a shared sleeping area, and that during his visit, a bunch of European travelers happened to be staying there too. He said that there were two Spanish girls and a Dutchman all traveling together after graduating from college over there or something. Pop-Pop said that they were nice folks, and he chatted with them a little before they all turned in for the night. But then, in the middle of the night, he woke up to the sound of screaming. Someone turned on the light to find one of the Spanish girls sitting up and crying in bed. There was a huge chunk of her hair missing, and when they looked underneath her bed, they found her hair just lying there on the floor. My dad says that she was hysterical for a few minutes, so no one could figure out what had happened until she calmed down a little. But when she finally spoke, what Pop Pop heard terrified him. The girl said that she had been having a nightmare where someone had been pulling her hair. Then the next thing she knew, she was awake and part of her scalp felt like it was on fire. She put her hand to her head and said that she could feel that some of her hair was loose and connecting that sensation to the dream that she just had, she became so scared that she just completely freaked out. Everyone was sleeping when she woke up too. There was nothing moving around her so the confusion of not knowing who pulled her hair out only added to her fright. Pop Pop said that no one got any more sleep that night and they kept each other's spirits up until dawn before getting back on the road again as soon as there was enough light to do so. Pop Pop said that there was no sign of the Posada's owner on their way out but that as he was riding off on his bike he caught sight of one watching him from the window of what must have been their bedroom. There's no way that they couldn't have heard the Spanish girl's screams. They were out in the middle of nowhere and the sleeping area wasn't all that far away from their bedroom. It'd be 20 or 30 meters across the courtyard. Pop Pop said it was like they knew to stay away from the sleeping area, which let Pop Pop know that he should stay away from that whole place entirely. I once asked him what he thought had happened, as in who pulled out the Spanish girl's hair. 
and he just sighed and told me that the world is full of some beautiful, wonderful people, but also some real sick ones too. And to say that that stuck with me would be an understatement. My grandma once told me that back when she was 17, she almost got kidnapped, or worse. When she was 17, she had a driver's license, a car, and an after-school job, which kind of makes you feel like a huge loser in comparison, but oh well, I guess. She said that sometimes her shift wouldn't start until maybe an hour or two after school, so she'd park in an adjacent lot from the store and take a cat nap. One day, a guy in a black sedan pulls up beside her, gets out of his car, and then stops and knocks on her window. Grandma rolls down her window, and a man in a smart black business suit asks if she might be able to help him with something. He was headed into a nearby bank to sign some documents, and these documents somehow required the signature of his wife, too. Unfortunately, she was caught up with a minor medical emergency involving one of their children and wouldn't be able to make it until the situation was resolved. Not knowing what that might be and being desperate to get the document signed, the stranger asked if my grandma might be so kind as to pose as his wife, just for a minute, so he could get his banking papers filed or whatever. Grandma said that she was pretty taken aback by the request and was concerned that it might be illegal. The man said that yes, it was technically breaking the rules, but that she had his wife's consent to fake a signature and that ultimately no one would find out. Grandma was still a little hesitant, so the guy offered her $50 cash if she'd do him the favor. Getting the documents signed would unlock tens of thousands of dollars, so 50 bucks would be a very small price to pay to get his hands on that kind of money. Eventually, my grandma is right on the verge of agreeing to do it, thinking, sure, what's the harm? But then she checks the time and realizes that she's just a few minutes away from starting her shift. She had to totally reverse herself, having been almost on the verge of accepting the guy's offer, and he knew it too. The guy started getting increasingly desperate, leaning in further and further into her open car window until finally, he snapped. He went from saying, please, it'll only take a minute, to get the hell out of the car, you little tramp, in just a fraction of a second. And what terrified my grandma even more was how another man rose up from the back seat of the sedan. He'd been hiding there, but when he revealed himself, he got out of the car and started helping the man in the nice suit to open the car door and drag my grandma out of her vehicle. The whole thing was only stopped when someone came out of the store armed with a pistol and fired it into the air to scare the two guys off. Grandma said it was the most terrified she'd ever been in her life, and that she sent the owner Christmas cards every year until he passed away and the place closed down. When I was about five or six years old, I was visiting my grandparents in the city with my mom, dad, and sister. We were walking towards the city center, so it was pretty crowded, and I remember letting go of my granddad's hand and then feeling him grab back hold of it a few moments later. I kept walking, I don't know how far, but then I hear someone shouting from behind me and grabbing my other arm. I hear him say sorry, and I look up and realize I was holding hands with an old man that I didn't know. My granddad assumed that I'd accidentally grabbed onto this man's hand thinking it was him. I remember him pulling me away all embarrassed and I was just thinking, but the man grabbed my hand and I remembered how he tugged on it too to get me to walk with him. I think some guy tried to snatch me out of a crowded area. I still don't understand why my granddad thought I grabbed onto his hand. My grandparents were normally quite paranoid about strangers. One time, my grandma and I were doing some backcountry camping in the northwest of Washington State. We made camp and ate dinner in a fire-restricted patch of the National Forest, which, as you can guess, meant no campfire. We made dinner and went to bed at around 10 p.m., but spent the next few hours talking before we actually did sleep. 
Right when I was dozing off at around 1am, I think, I heard a rustling in the trees above us, and then the frog stopped croaking, and then more rustling in the trees. I whispered to my grandpa if he heard that, and he said that he had. We were both tired, but we were suddenly keyed up and very alert. There was more rustling in the trees. Finally, I was tired of the waiting to see what the hell this thing was, so I rolled over and a flashlight. So I rolled over and grabbed a flashlight, and then shined it into the woods to see what was sneaking up on us. What came falling out of the tree and landing right beside me was none other than about a 200 pound mountain lion. It hit the bush next to me and disappeared into the night in a flash. Needless to say, we packed up and hiked out immediately. Our exodus from the woods looked like a scene from pitch black, as every light we had brought was turned on and taped to something. Many years ago, my grandfather and I were driving home from one of my swimming lessons when he suddenly seemed strangely on edge. For some background, I was a little kid, I lived with my grandparents, and my grandpa was a cop. It also happened that our house had been the target of two recent break-ins that week, but the suspects were believed to be neighborhood kids just messing around because nothing had been taken. Suddenly, grandpa pulled over and the car behind us just so happened to pull over too. Grandpa tells me to lay down in the back seat and then turns off the lights in his truck, locks the doors after grabbing his gun out of the center console. I hear him yelling at a guy, telling him to leave him alone, and I hear the guy yelling some things back. I just remember being very confused and scared. I'm not sure how long later, but I'm assuming it was a lot shorter than it felt. I saw two squad cars pull up. The door on my side opens and I'm faced by two police officers in uniform who helped me out of the truck. And I later heard my grandpa say that the stranger had threatened to shoot him and me, as well as follow him home and murder my mom and sister too. About a year ago, I found out from my dad that the man was a friend of some drug dealers my grandpa had arrested and was likely looking for some way to even the score. They found that he had had pictures of the inside of our house as well as some miscellaneous belongings. I don't know what happened to the guy, but I hope he's in jail. The thought of what could have happened still scares me. My grandmother was addicted to those dieting pills from the late 50s and 60s, the kind they used to call Mother's Little Helper. The Rolling Stones wrote a song about it, and these things were basically just legally available speed, and it's crazy they were even allowed to sell it in the first place. My grandma got herself addicted. So bad, in fact, that she owned a collection of wigs that she used to impersonate other women so she could steal their prescriptions and feed her habit. I think it probably goes without saying that she went through some terrible things to end up in that position, but for clarity's sake, her mom, my great-grandmother, passed away when she was just six years old. Around six months later, her father remarried, but he married a woman who had open contempt for his children. She used to basically starve my grandma for days at a time, allowing her only cold leftovers and even the most minor infraction of her many, many rules resulted in an ungodly amount of physical and emotional abuse. And to escape, a 17-year-old grandma married a widower in his 30s, but just a few years into their marriage, when my mom was only one year old, grandpa drove his car off of a bridge. Witnesses said that he did it on purpose, and this left her alone with hardly any money to live off and two young mouths to feed. She actually initially got those wigs due to her hair falling out because of the stress, but then she realized that she could use them for other purposes too. She still had them when I was a kid in the 90s, and I used to wear them for fun, although I didn't learn about their true purpose until a long dinner on a family vacation many years later. She told her entire life story from the start, and every detail has stuck in my mind. She went cold turkey when she saw the police at the house of one of her neighbors, who just so happened to be one of the women that she had been impersonating. It scared her straight, and she stopped scamming for pills that very same day. 
She also said that there was a time where she met a guy who promised her all the pills she could ever want. She'd just have to do a few things for him in return. It turns out this guy was a pimp and was later arrested and charged with murder after beating one of his girls to death. Grandma says that if she'd have worked for the guy, that probably would have been her getting scooped off of a motel mattress with her skull caved in. To look at her later in life, you would never have guessed that she went through anything remotely as traumatic and she was just a well-adjusted woman. She was also the sweetest little old lady you'd ever meet, although she had a wicked dry sense of humor. All of my best memories growing up were with her. I was always the awkward weird kid and she let me be myself, be creative, dress up and she was honestly my best friend. She died surrounded by her family in 2014 while she was in her 80s and I miss her every day. When I was six, my grandma, my mom's mom, wanted me to sleep over at her place for the weekend. The trouble was, my grandma never liked me, and she and my mom didn't get along whatsoever, so my mom said no. She got really angry, slammed the phone down, and that was that, or so we thought. We didn't hear from her for a while afterward, then one day, the cops knocked on our front door. Grandma was dead from an overdose, which was bad enough, but here's where things get really creepy. As part of dividing up her estate, my mom got her hands on Grandma's diary, and in it, she found an entry that in so many words said this. She planned on poisoning me that night that she wanted me to sleep over, saying that I was rotten and that ending me would be a favor to everyone. There was obviously no danger of that happening in reality because mom would never let me stay there. But if they'd had a better relationship, enough so that me staying there was an option, I legitimately might not be around to type this right now. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a thought that I try not to dwell on. Growing up, my dad always hated the smell of nail polish remover, and we later learned it was because he accidentally drank some of his sister's nail polish as a toddler, which resulted in him being rushed to the hospital. But then, one night, he told me how that wasn't strictly true. According to dad, when his parents were going through the Great Depression, they lost everything, as many families did, but it affected my grandmother horribly. Something must have snapped in her because she slowly but surely started to lose her mind. The real reason the smell of nail polish remover was so horrible to my dad was because one day, my grandmother had decided that feeding my dad the nail polish remover as an infant in a crib was an easy way to kill him. In her mind, it was a mercy, and it was only my grandfather rushing in and stopping her that stopped my dad from dying. It makes me wonder what sort of behaviors I might be prone to, given some traits are more prevalent to every other generation. It scares me thinking that I might have that same kind of madness deep within me. My grandfather, from my mother's side, died way before I was born. I was always told that he fell off a balcony and died. A year or two ago, I found out what truly happened. When I was around 13, my mom was telling the story to my uncle's girlfriend while we, my mom, uncle's girlfriend, and me were sitting at the table. I was just minding my own business while my mom was whispering to my uncle's girlfriend, and at some point I heard my mom tell something about her dad, and I started listening to what she was saying. She explained that her dad was an alcoholic and could be real abusive at times. When he got drunk, he would sometimes make wild threats to himself or others. On the night before my mom's birthday, after he put her and her siblings to bed, he got drunk and threatened to throw himself off the balcony. He stood on the edge of the balcony, on the other side of the fence thing, with my grandma trying to calm him down to get him safe inside. It worked. My grandfather calmed down. But instead of getting inside, he accidentally let go of the fence 
and fell off the balcony. He probably thought if he landed in a correct way, he would break too many bones or something, so he tried to move while in the air, and it didn't work, and he died. So yeah, when my mom woke up the next morning, on her birthday, her father was dead. Some details may be wrong. It's been, like I said, a year or two ago since I heard this story, and frankly, I'm too timid and kind of scared to ask my mom the whole story again because it'll always be a sensitive topic. My family is a mess in general, but the worst detail by far is that my grandparents are murderers. First thing was I found a letter on my mom's desk in high school. It was from my grandpa, her dad, but it was addressed from a federal state prison. I had absolutely no clue that he was in prison, so I picked up the courage and asked her what the hell was going on. He was elderly and a bit eccentric, but not at all violent or dangerous. She tells me he's in there because he pleaded guilty to first-degree murder of his wife's mother, my mom's stepmom. Apparently, she was 95 years old and bed-bound with dementia, then after they found out that she had cancer, he smothered her. Grandma proceeds to tell me that the man who I know as Grandpa is not my mom's real dad. My mom's real dad was a violent drunk, came home one night with a gun threatening to kill my grandma, the children, and himself. Grandma wrestles the gun from him and fatally shoots him. She was never convicted as it was ruled self-defense. See why I think my family is an absolute mess? I found out that my grandparents were in a cult for more than 10 years. Over the years of being a kid, I had always wondered why they never came to family get-togethers anymore and why I never got to see them. My mom would always tell me that it was because they were reserved and liked their privacy. I always thought that that was weird, but never questioned it. One year, they moved from their home state to the state where my grandma and the rest of my dad's side of the family now lived. Now all of a sudden, I was able to see them when I went out to visit in the summer, which I thought was odd. I also thought it was weird that they lived with my grandma and literally had moved out with nothing but a few suitcases. As it turns out, my aunt's family had been in a religious cult for years and weren't able to leave it because they were threatened by the church. They told them that they would kill them and make sure they never escaped. They would keep track of when they went to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and they were forced to give the church thousands of dollars a month just to remain. One day my aunt said that she had had enough, packed a few bags, and booked it to the state my grandma lived in during the middle of the night. They left their furniture, the vast majority of their clothes, almost everything, they moved in with my aunt and lived with her until they got back onto their feet. And they have been out of it for years now and have made a good life for themselves. And I'm very happy they can move on from what happened. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or send it over email, let's read submissions at gmail.com, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button here on YouTube to hear about the extra perks offered for members of the channel. And check out the Let's Read Podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts, new episodes every Tuesday at noon EST, all links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, your bathwater is my Flava Flav. <laughs>